True enthusiasts don't really care for SUVs. Well, I mean, they're just boring family cars, aren't they? And who wants to be part of some fashion fad anyway? This is the Alfa Romeo Stelvio Quadrifoglio, and it's here to change your mind. Now the trouble with SUVs for most enthusiasts is that they tend to be more style over substance. And I will freely admit, this being an Italian car, there is the danger of that. I mean, it is beautiful. Voluptuous curves, total lack of the aggressive creases and lines that have become the norm of premium cars these days. The Stelvio really celebrates its elegance. Though, if you look closer at the details, such as those aggressive bonnet louvers, it suggests there's a little bit more going on under the surface. Underneath that sculpted carbon fibre bonnet is a twin turbocharged 2.9 litre V6 engine. And it has absolutely nothing to do with Ferrari. No. I mean, Ferrari engineers may have gone on holiday to Alfa Romeo and got involved with some extracurricular activities and helped produce an engine. But officially speaking, that never happened. It's an Alfa Romeo engine, okay? And it should be familiar because it's the same one out of the very successful Giulia Quadrifoglio. So that means it packs 503 brake horsepower and 443 pounds feet of torque. The big difference here, or in the UK anyway, because we only get a rear wheel drive Julia, is that the Stelvio is all wheel drive. It's got a Q4 intelligent all wheel drive system that connects both the engine and the wheels via an eight speed ZF automatic transmission. Now all of that performance potential culminates in a vehicle that will do zero to 62 miles per hour in just 3.8 seconds and has a top speed of 178 miles per hour. And it sounds something like this. <laughs> glorious soundtrack to drive along to. It's so pure and a cappella in the way that it delivers. And for a turbocharged engine, it sounds incredible. It's not synthesized like a lot of hot hatches these days, where there's lots of pops and bangs artificially put into the car. It's, it's got a real purity and it sounds great. And this past week, I've just found myself using these not at all inspired by Ferrari aluminium gear shift paddles to play conductor my very own six cylinder orchestra. Now I know the SUV skeptics will already be saying, but all wheel drive dulls the fun, it adds weight, it makes everything far too understeery when the going gets twisty. And on a lot of SUVs, you'd be right. But credit where credit's due, this Q4 all wheel drive system is great. It sends up to 100% of power to the rear of the car, making it have this playful, agile chassis. Up to 50% can be sent to the front when the chassis detects some slip or loose surfaces, or you just need some more grip to pull the nose into a corner. But generally speaking, it's playful, it's agile. Team it with this really direct responsive steering and a general resistance to body roll, and you'll find that this car behaves much more like a sports car than a family SUV. The Stelvio Quadrifoglio, as you might expect, is governed by a series of selectable drive modes aptly named DNA. Uh, and it's selectable via this little scroll wheel down here. So in A, the car will actually deactivate cylinders in a bid to try and save some fuel. But as I wrote earlier this week, it's a bit like using a damp tea towel to put out the great fire of London. I mean, the best we've seen out of this car on our best behavior is about 24 miles to the gallon. Put it into N and everything sort of wakes up a little bit. And this is the mode that I find myself driving along in most. I find A dulls the throttle a bit too much. N, everything's reasonably responsive, the steering, you know, feels more natural, and the gear selection as well doesn't feel quite as lazy. And this is the mode, I suppose, that you'd find yourself trundling in. D is for dynamic, and that is actually where the Stelvio Quattrofolio feels at its most natural. The suspension firms up, the steering gains a good amount of weighting, throttle response becomes almost instantaneous, which is really impressive for a turbocharged engine, and the gearbox is at its most alert. And generally speaking, you can pick up a real great rhythm chopping through some ribbons of tarmac in this car. There's a strong resistance to any lean you get in tall cars, and the agility is just incredible. It, it changes direction far faster than, well, a car of this size has any right to. But more importantly, it's engaging and it's involving, and you can feel what's going on. And this is just so alien in an SUV, super SUV or not. 
usually things are dulled, you're distanced from the road, but here I can feel the chassis move beneath me. I feel like I'm plugged into what's going on. And like I said, because that rear biased all wheel drive system, oh, it just absolutely leaps from corner to corner. And the momentum you build is just preserved thanks to that sticky Pirelli rubber and ample grip available. I mean, it really is a, a fast cross country car, this. However, whilst you're enjoying the very best of our beautiful British country roads in this utterly fantastic car, you'll note that the suspension is maybe a little firm. And that's the last thing you want whenever you're going into a series of sharp bends is the car unsettling itself over high frequency bumps. Thankfully, there is this not at all inspired by Ferrari bumpy road mode where you can push it and it softens the suspension whilst keeping the car in its most dynamic settings elsewhere. And that is perfect. It means it's just about supple enough to take up the road imperfections, but everything else remains really dialed in. And I have to say, this setup is perfect for the UK. Now, when you twist and hold the DNA dial, it will click over into race mode. And this is the car in its most aggressive setting. Everything is turned up to 11 and boy, do you know about it. The engine is at its most vocal, gear shifts are borderline ferocious and the acceleration is just incredible out of corners. You'll also notice that the electronic nannies give you a lot more slack in this mode and that is primarily because electronic stability control turns off in this setting and in the right environment that's a lot of fun there's a lot more movement through the car there's a lot more slip that can be had but in the wrong environment it will put you in a ditch so just be wary of that. <laughs> You know, in a family SUV, you simply shouldn't be having this much fun, but family SUV it is, so it has to balance the equation on the other side. So you'll find the interior to be reasonably spacious, the rear bench seats three, and head and legroom are okay, but I would say something like an F-Pace SVR does better for rear passenger space. And up front, you'll find some exotic materials. There's lots of carbon fiber and beautifully stitched leathers. However, there are also some scratchy plastics that really aren't befitting of a car that's over 70,000 pounds. Another gripe I have is to do with this 8.8 .8 inch infotainment system. And whilst the screen's a good size and it is beautifully integrated into the dashboard, unlike what you get with Mercedes, where they basically plonk an iPad on the dashboard, um, it's not actually all that ergonomic. It's perfectly functional, it's got Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and I like that there are some physical controls for stuff like air conditioning and scrolling through in a, I suppose, a similar manner to iDrive with this plunger down here. But the, the software itself is just menu inside menu, it's just, to change settings and things, it becomes quite frustrating, and whilst you will learn it over time, it's just not the most natural thing to use. The good news is that there's an updated variant of this car due imminently, and one of the revisions is to the infotainment system. Looking at this pleasantly simplistic leather and Alcantara steering wheel, you might also notice this start-stop button for the engine that's not at all inspired by a Ferrari 488. Mm -mm, not at all. The boot's not bad either, at 525 litres, with a nice big wide aperture for loading and unloading bulky items. There's also no load lip, so the dog will easily jump in and out as well. However, the Stelvio again loses out to the Jaguar F-Pace in terms of overall practicality. Now, this wouldn't be a true Alfa Romeo without some flaws that leave you scratching your head. Things like the cabin that seems to creak for no reason whatsoever, or the very slow electric tailgate at the rear. Maybe some of this switch gear that doesn't feel like it'll quite run the course. But the one that really has me baffled is that you can only have the loudest setting for the exhaust in race mode, which means the stability control's turned off. So if you want to enjoy the sonorous noise this car is capable of producing, you have an equally good chance of putting yourself in a ditch. Now, fair play to Alfa Romeo, this is to be fixed in the revised version of the car but as things stand at the moment if i want to hear the full force of that 503 brake horsepower engine i do very much take my life in my own hands in a vehicle that weighs not far off two tons the alfa romeo stelvio quadrifoglio is every inch as good as the julia quadrifoglio and that is high praise indeed the drivetrain is utterly stunning the noise it makes is magnificent the performance is out of this world Sprinkle in those added practicalities of it being an SUV, like a decent sized boot and space for your mother-in-law in the back. And you've got a pretty good car that ticks a lot of boxes. Now I know SUVs aren't everybody's cup of tea, but this car really does deserve those Quattrofolio badges that it wears. 
And I think of all of the SUVs out there, even the most militant crossover protester has to give this car some credit. It's utterly, utterly fantastic. And for the petrol head, I think it might just be the best car in its class. Mm -hmm.